And I have something exciting to tell you. Oh, cool. I, you know, I have all these exciting things happen, but it, it, it doesn't feel like it's um, continuous enough that to feel like I've turned my life around, because obviously you have and still have the same, many of the same struggles, but at least I'm getting some bright spots here and there. Yep. So I'm, I'm, I told you I was reading Psycho-Cybernetics, right? And I was really enjoying that. And I didn't quite finish it. I'm, I'm still working on it. The, the very beginning of the book was a little bit boring because he's describing his background and stuff. And then, then it gets pretty exciting in the middle. And then now I'm near the end, and it's not quite as exciting as it was in the middle. But, but I'm, I'm still I'm, I'm reading it, and I'm going to finish it, and I think I'm going to do it again another time and make a point of doing the exercises that, that he um, recommends. And okay. there, are a lot, there are a lot of um, relaxation and visioning and all that kind of stuff, right? Yep. But, and I think the one that I think is really good is the is the going to your quiet room so that you can reset your mind. So I really got to buckle down and do that. But um, I started. I I went to um, one of those thrift stores for my Halloween costume, and I always check the books. And E squared was there, and it was just it was kind of. You know what? That's two things that have happened. Okay, so I went like a week ago, or little, yeah, about a week ago, and um, and I had E squared written on a little t sticky for me to remember to to get that book, right? So when I went to the the store, the the thrift store, sure enough, it, it was there this time. Mm. Plus, dad shoes, which I've been looking for forever, like they're. They're special shoes that have like a Cuban heel and they have a uh, suede um, sole so that you can, you, you don't stick onto the floor when you're trying to twirl and all that kind of stuff. And then they have a, a steel shaft and they're really light and they're really nice. And I found them for $10. Wow. I know. So I was going, wow, this is just amazing that this happened today. So, and they're in your size. Oh. Yeah, they were. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. And they're really pretty, even. They're like silver sparkly. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. So so then I started reading A Squared. And you've read it, right? Are you, do you mean U Squared? No, E Squared by Pam oh. Grout. I'm sure you, you said something about Pam Grout. Maybe it wasn't you. Mm, maybe not. He has a really down to earth way of talking about. Um, universal intelligence and our vibration and it's it's nine easy experiments to do to um so that you believe in in your power ah. so the very first one was and i'm going oh my god i don't know if i want to do this because what if it doesn't work for me and i'm going to be disappointed and blah 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 mm -hmm. so, so the very first experiment was that you're supposed to demand of universal intelligence something that is a gift of some sort that is going to be irrefutable proof that if they're looking after you and you give it 48 hours <sighs> oh. Going, oh my gosh well okay I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do the the affirmation exactly as she says mm -hmm. and so i did it and Jan, I, you have to make note of the date and the time and so the time what came and passed and i i thought you know what it didn't work it didn't work and then i realized now maybe this isn't irrefutable proof but i'm going to call it irrefutable proof almost like to the minute i mean time was almost running out on the 48 hours my boss did our payroll and she, I had last month, I had 137 hours. This month, I only had 119. So I got my, but I got a bonus and stuff this month. So it was, and, and I needed some of my holiday pay tickets. So it was, it was like a lot of extra steps that she had to do. But I, so I got my pay slip at like, all, like to the minute almost, but I didn't recognize it at the time. Yep. He had overpaid me by like about, like after taxes, about three hundred and sixty dollars. Oh, wow! <laughs> so I figured out what happened. 
had paid me for the same number of hours as I had last month instead of reducing it, right? Because she was so worried about all this other stuff she had to do. Mm -hmm. And she was doing some other stuff on other people's payroll as well. So she just overlooked it. So I went back to her and I said, you know, as much as I'd like this paycheck, I don't think I really earned it. <laughs> and I think this is what happened. So she came back and says, oh, she says it's too late to change it because I've already sent the transfer through. Can we just adjust it next month? And I said, sure. And then, um, and then she, she said, oh, I'm not, sorry. I don't know why it's years that I screw up all the time, which she doesn't. Not, you know, she may, maybe she'll miss a note once in a while. But then I said, well, you know, if I wasn't such a pain in the butt, and she came back and said, no, no way. She says, let's not make an adjustment. Let's just call it a bonus for all the hard work. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> yeah. And so then later that day, I'm thinking, that was it. That was yeah. my thing. Yes. <laughs> because, uh, wow, what, what a, I couldn't think of a rarer place that it could come from. I know. You know, isn't, who would have thought? <laughs> isn't that just neat, Nicole? So that, that gave me proof yeah. that, that it does work. You ask and it's good. <laughs> So there's yeah. quite a few. There's quite a few other ones now that I've like I've read through. But you're supposed to uh, like do one experiment at a time. So tomorrow I'm gonna do another one. Like there's there's other things. There's one where you actually put some hangers together somehow, and then when you think thoughts, they actually move oh. because of your vibration changes. It it moves the the hang the wire hangers or something and i'm thinking oh my gosh i gotta try this I'm oh yeah that sounds interesting it's so cool can it's, you tell me the name of the author again it's pam grout g-r-o-u-t and it's e squared e2 okay hmm. and it's really she's like i mean she's really down to earth it's really it sounds like it could be a fun one to study together, you know, if we're all doing the experiments. Yeah, then we could all do the experiments together. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, like I, the time passed and I was really busy that day with work and stuff too. And then, and all of a sudden it got to be like three or four o'clock in the afternoon and I went, oh, the t 48 hours went by and it didn't work. And then a few minutes later I went, yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh that's so cool i know i know so yeah i i think it would be a great book to do together so we could all do the experiment yeah because yeah. again you talk so much about acting as if and and um but this helps you to act because you have more faith you actually see something happen yeah and i think that's where uh, I was listening a little bit to Noah St. John again today, and he talks about having one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. And I think that's what we're all doing. Yes. That's know? such a good way to put it. That's exactly what we do. That is exact. And she talks a lot about that, not in that terminology, but how how we, we, we try to focus our thoughts, but we let them get sidetracked by the negative thoughts. And they actually like cancel each other out. Mm. And then I thought, okay, and then there's what Abraham was saying. As long as you keep it on the positive side, things will happen. But we must not be keeping the positive thoughts at the 51% minimum, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're that's really interesting because that's what he starts to talk about in, in this part of this chapter. Right. So, yeah, it's so, so good, Nicole. It just all these different authors and they have different ways of putting it and sometimes it resonates with you better than someone else kind of you know it's just it's really cool you know what else yeah. i saw blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> I, <laughs> there's a, maybe you saw it too that there's a new edition of the science of getting rich for the 21st century oh who wrote that I don't know. You know what? I if I had would have had the money, I would have bought it. But I saw saw it on Amazon. Oh. So I think I'm going to order it. So it's like re rewritten in in our terminology in this for this day and age. With okay. That kind of I always find those things 
I be you know read them with a grain of salt because it's always the person's opinion. You know how like people translate the Bible, but right. they translate yeah. it in their understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I believe Pam Grout has some really good thoughts on the Bible as well in that book and on Jesus. Oh, good. It's really good. I really am enjoying that book. So it was, it, that was one of my first miracles that the book was there when I went, right? <laughs> and that the next miracle happened because of that book. Yeah. That's really, cool. That's really good. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, maybe we'll talk to the others about doing that one after we're done. Um, Genevieve Duran's book, maybe. Yeah. I wonder if we can get it in PDF. Yeah, I don't know. Let's have a look. Shall we make a start? Yeah. Okay. So how how many lines are we reading here? How many um, one, two, three, four, six, seven. There's about seven pages. So if we read three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's about, it's, it's less than 300 lines. Okay. So if I do like 150 lines at least. That would be good. Okay, so we're on how to develop persistence, right? Yep. There are four simple steps which lead to the habit of persistence. They call for no great amount of intelligence, no particular amount of education, and but little time or effort. The necessary steps are, one, a definite purpose backed by burning desire for its fulfillment. Two, a definite plan expressed in continuous action. Three, a mind closed tightly against all negative and discouraging influences, including negative suggestions of relatives, friends, and acquaintances. Four, a friendly alliance with one or more persons who will encourage one to follow through with both plan and purpose. These four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the 13 principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps as a matter of habit. These are the steps by which one may control one's economic destiny. They are the steps that lead to freedom and independence of thought. They are the steps that lead to riches in small or great quantities. They lead the way to power, fame, and worldly recognition. They are the four steps which guarantee favorable breaks. They are the steps that convert dreams into physical realities. They lead also to the mastery of fear, discouragement, indifference. There is a magnificent reward for all who learn to take these four steps. It is the privilege of writing one's own ticket and of making life yield whatever price is asked. I have no way of knowing the facts, but I venture to conjecture that Mrs. Wallace Simpson's great love for a man was not accidental, nor the result of favorable breaks alone. There was a burning desire and careful searching at every step of the way. Her first duty was to love. What is the greatest thing on earth? The master called it love, not man-made rules, criticism, bitterness, slander, or political marriages, but love. She knew what she wanted, not after she met the Prince of Wales, but long before that. Twice when she had failed to find it, she had the courage to continue her search. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night, the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Her rise from obscurity was of the slow, progressive, persistent order, but it was sure. She triumphed over unbelievably long odds, and no matter who you are or what you may think of Wallace Simpson or the king who gave up his crown for her love, she is an astounding example of applied persistence, an instructor on the rules of self-determination from whom the entire world might profitably profitably take lessons. When you think of Wallace Simpson, think of one who knew what she wanted and shook the great, greatest empire on earth to get it. Women who complain that this is a man's world, that women do not have an equal chance to win, owe it to themselves to study carefully the life of this unusual woman who, at an age which most women consider old, captured the affections of the most desirable bachelor in the entire world. 
And what of King Edward? What lesson may we learn from his part in the world's greatest drama of recent times? Did he pay too high a price for the affections of the woman of his choice? Surely no one but he can give the correct answer. The rest of us can only conjecture. This much we know. The king came into the world without his own consent. He was born to great riches without requesting them. He was persistently sought in marriage. Politicians and statesmen throughout Europe tossed dowagers and princesses at his feet. Because he was the firstborn of his parents, he inherited a crown, a crown which he did not seek and perhaps did not desire. For more than 40 years, he was not a free agent, could not live his life in his own way, had but little privacy, and finally assumed duties inflicted upon him when he ascended the throne. Some will say, with all these blessings, King Edward should have found peace of mind, contentment, and joy of living. The truth is that back of all the privileges of a crown, all the money, the fame, and the power inherited by King Edward, there was an emptiness which could be filled only by love. His greatest desire was for love. Long before he met Wallace Simpson, he doubtless felt this great universal emotion tugging at the strings of his heart, beating upon the door of his soul and crying out for expression. And when he met a kindred spirit, crying out for this same holy privilege of expression, he recognized it and without fear or apology, opened his heart and bade it enter. All the scandal mongers in the world cannot destroy the beauty of this international drama through which two people found love and had the courage to face open criticism, renounce all else to give it holy expression. King Edward's decision to give up the crown of the world's most powerful empire for the privilege of going the remainder of the way through life with the woman of his choice was a decision that required courage. The decision also had a price, but who has the right to say the price was too great? Surely not he who said, he among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. As a suggestion to any evil-minded person who chooses to find fault with the Duke of Windsor because, of, because his desire was for love and for openly declaring his love for Wallace Simpson and giving up his throne for her, let it be remembered that the open declaration was not essential. He could have followed the custom of clandestine liaison which has prevailed in Europe for centuries without giving up either his throne or the woman of his choice, and there would have been no complaint from either church or laity. But his unusual man, this unusual man was built of sterner stuff. His love was clean, it was deep and sincere. It represented the one thing which, above all else, he truly desired. Therefore, he took what he wanted and paid the price demanded. If Europe had been blessed with more rulers, with the human heart and the traits of honesty of ex-King Edward for the past century, that unfortunate hemisphere, now seething with greed, hate, lust, political connivance, and threats of war, would have a different and better story to tell, a story in which love and not hate would rule. Do you want to read for a bit? <clears throat> in the world, words of Stuart Austin Weir, we raise our cup and drink this toast to an ex to ex-King Edward and Wallace Simpson. Blessed is the man who has come to know that our muted thoughts are our sweetest thoughts. Blessed is the man who, from the blackest depths, can see the luminous figure of love and seeing, sing and singing say, sweeter far than utter lays are the thoughts I have of you. In these words, would we pay tribute to the two people who, more than all others of modern times, have been the victims of certain of criticism and the recipients of abuse because they found life's greatest treasure and claimed it. Mrs. Simpson read and approved this analysis. Most of the world will applaud the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson because of their persistence in searching until they found life's greatest reward. All of us can profit by following their example in our own search for that which we demand of life. What mystical power gives to men of persistence the capacity to master difficulties? 
Does the quality of persistence set up in one's mind some form of spiritual, mental or chemical activity which gives one access to supernatural forces? Does infinite intelligence throw itself on the side of a person who, who still fights on after the battle has been lost with the whole world on the opposite side? These and many other similar questions have arisen in my mind as I've observed men like Henry Ford, who started at scratch and built an industrial empire of huge proportions with, with little else in the way of beginning but persistence. Or Thomas A. Edison, who with less than three months of schooling became the world's leading inventor and converted persistence into the talking machine, the moving picture machine and the incandescent light to say nothing of half a hundred other useful inventions. I had the happy privilege of analysing both Mr Edison and Mr Ford year by year over a long period of years and therefore the opportunity to study them at close range so I speak from actual knowledge when I say that I found no quality save persistence in either of them and even remotely that even remotely suggested the, the major source of their stupendous achievements. As one makes an impartial study of the prophets, philosophers, miracle men and religious leaders of the past, one is drawn to the inevitable conclusion that persistence, concentration of effort and definiteness of purpose were the major sources of their achievements. Consider for example the strange and fascinating story of Muhammad. Analyse his life, compare him with men of achievement in his modern age of industry and finance and observe how they have one outstanding trait in common, persistence. If you are keenly interested in studying the strange power that gives potency to persistence, read a biography of Muhammad, especially the, the one by Isad Bey. This brief review of that book by Thomas Segru in the Herald Tribune will provide a preview of the rare treat in store for those who take the time to read the entire story of one of the most astounding examples of the power of persistence known to civilization. The Last Great Prophet, reviewed by Thomas Segru. Muhammad was a prophet, but he never performed a miracle. He was not a mystic. He had no formal schooling. He did not begin his mission until he was 40. When he announced that he was the messenger of God, bringing word, the word of the true religion, he was ridiculed and labelled a lunatic. Children tripped him and women threw filth upon him. He was banished from his native city, Mecca, and his followers were stripped of their worldly goods and sent into the desert after him. When he had been preaching 10 years, he had nothing to show for it but banishment, poverty and ridicule. Yet before an another 10 years had passed, he was dictator of all Arabia, ruler of Mecca, and the head of the new world religion, which was to sweep to the uh, Danube and the Pyrenees, Pyrenees yeah. before yeah. exhausting the impetus he gave it. That impetus was threefold, the power of words, the, efficient, the efficiency of prayer, and man's kinship with God. His career never made sense. Yeah, his career never made sense. Muhammad was born into impoverished members of the leading family of Mecca. Because Mecca, the crossroads of the world, home of the magic stone called the Kaaba, great city of trade and the centre of trade route, routes, was unsanitary. Its children were sent to be raised in the desert by the, the Bedouins. Muhammad was thus nurtured, drawing strength and health from the milk of nomad, vicarious mothers. He tended sheep and soon hired out to a rich widow, his leader of her caravans. He traveled in all parts of the Eastern world, talked with many men of diverse beliefs and observed in decline, the decline of Christianity into warring sex. When he was 28, Kadija, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> the widow, looked upon him with favour and married him. Her father would have objected to such a marriage, so she got him drunk and held him up while he gave the, pat the paternal blessing. For the next 12 years, Muhammad lived as a rich and respected and very shrewd trader. Then he took, a wandering, took to wandering in the desert, and one day he returned with the first verse of the Quran and told 
Khadija that the Archangel Gabriel had appeared to him and said that he was to be the messenger of God. The Quran, the revealed word of God, was the closest thing to a miracle in Muhammad's life. He had not been a poet, he had no gifts of words, yet the verses of the Quran as he received them and recited them to the faithful were better than any verses which the professional poets of the tribes could produce. This to the Arabs was a miracle. To them the gift of words was the greatest gift. The poet was all powerful. In addition to the Quran said that all men were equal before God. The word sh the world should be a democratic state, Islam. It was the, his political hearsay plus Muhammad's desire to destroy all the 360 idols in the courtyard of the Kaaba, which brought about his banishment. The idols brought the desert tribes to Mecca and that meant trade. So the businessmen of Mecca and the capitals of which he had won, of which he had been one, set upon Muhammad. Then he retreated to the desert and demanded sovereignty over the world. The rise of Islam began. Out of the desert came a flame which would not be extinguished, a democratic army fighting as a unit and prepared to die without wincing. Muhammad had invited the Jews and Christians to join him, for he was not building a new religion. He was calling all who believed in one God to join in a single faith. If the Jews and Christians had accepted this invitation, Islam would have conquered the world. They didn't. They would not even accept Muhammad's invitation of humane warfare. When the armies of the prophets, prophet entered Jerusalem, not a single person was killed because of his faith. When the crusaders entered the city centuries later, not a Muslim man, woman or child was spared. But the Christians did accept one Muslim idea, the place of learning, the university. That's all pretty interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that is kind of interesting. Um, I really love the first part of this where it talks, he gives us the four steps and he says these four steps, I'll read what he says, these four steps are essential for the success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the 13 principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps as a matter of habit. Yeah, okay, let's read that again. Okay, so these four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the 13 principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps. Is a matter, okay. So I'm going, okay, the third, the, he's talking 13 principles and four steps. And so these, a yeah. little bit confusing, right? So these four steps that he's written down here, having a definite purpose, a plan with continuous action, a mind tightly closed against negative and discouraging influences like you were talking about yeah. before, yeah. Yeah. and a friendly alliance or a mastermind. So those four steps, and I've heard him say this, I think, in his lectures. He says, these are the four things that, um, create success and he's and then he says so why do I have all of the other ones to implement these four? Oh, that's what he's trying to say there okay yeah because yeah, we really got confused so that simplifies it for us if we stick to these four make sure we're completely implementing these four as habit yeah. The rest, the rest of it is just to help enforce these four. Exactly. Oh, that is really interesting. Yeah, and simplifying, and I like simple. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know what? Else, why I, I also that I'm saying that it's interesting because the next experiment that that I'm doing in from this E squared book is that you're supposed. It's about um, this chapter was about your intuition. And how you're supposed to ask yourself a very important question that's been bothering you. And it's got to be a yes or a no uh, type question or answer would be a yes or a no. And you ask for it again, 48 hours. For, and and you, but you got to look for the answer. So, my, so I just did this last night. And um, my question was, should I undertake this enter into this business and I told I think I told you about it a little bit yeah yeah and like I really logically like this book is telling you leave the logic out of everything just give your your 
command or your, you know, your, what you want. And then we, that's how we get in our way. That's how we put on the brakes is, is um, then leaving it up to our conscious mind to make the decision instead of our subconscious mind. Mm. So, so that was my question. So, so now I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, well, these four steps that I'm supposed to be doing absolutely fit in with this business because it gives me a purpose. It gives me the plan. I have the mastermind group. Yep. And because I, you, I have a mentor that's like with me every step. I have several mentors that are with me every step of the way. I'm going, okay, is this, is this the clue here? Is this what's telling me that, yes, I should be doing this? So that's, that's why I went, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, cause, but because uh, you got to pay attention, right, to the clues that are, that are coming up. Yeah. For you, so, but yeah, that, that makes it seem so much simpler, doesn't it? Just the four steps, it's just the other 13 are just helping you implement these four steps. Yeah. I, I love that paragraph. That's really nice, isn't it? And it reminds me of Earl Nightingale, how he says, and I can't remember the exact wording, but he says that um, success is the progressive realization of a worthy uh, ideal. ideal. Yeah. yeah. So how he says here in step two, continuous action. So if we, if we just take one step on, on that day, you yeah. know, you might take 10, ten steps the next day, but as long as you're taking one step closer, exactly you cannot fail right and yeah and so that and then number three that's i think that's the one where so many of us continue to fail because that's what we have learned and it's really hard to unlearn it right yeah and i think a lot of our negative influences come from ourselves saying mm -hmm. who are you to think you can do that or you've never done that before why should you be able to do it now exactly exactly and so then not that, it's, uh, there's also the other people's thoughts floating around around in the in the ether too right yeah like, so yeah keeping ourselves on a higher vibration so we're not in line with those thoughts exactly. i really loved the way bob proctor explained that he said you know if your thoughts are down here like he drew some horizontal lines above each other yeah and he said, if, you're th if your vibration's here and you're thinking here, he said, the, the thoughts for success are up here, like three or four lines above. He said, you've got to get yourself up here. So you're in alignment with these thoughts and these are the thoughts that are coming into your mind. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, I think that that's, that's the place where we're, ha we're having trouble is keeping ourselves in that high vibrational state, right? Yeah. And I think that's where acting as if is really helpful because if you're, we'll say, pretending to be feeling like that, eventually you do f cause yourself to feel like that. And so you bring yourself up to that wavelength. Exactly. And, and you know, reading this material and talking about it together and reading, doing your experiments, that, those things all help us to get back up on that. Plan. Yeah. because again it, it partly it's the repetition right so yeah. If, yeah. if we try to go it alone we forget and we, and we fall back into our own ways so old ways so so having um this this group helps us to to stay to, to get back on the right path right yeah, and we can all relate to each other, you know, like <clears throat> if you've had a friend who you've tried to talk this about this stuff with yeah. and they've said, you know, you're going a bit loopy, Yeah, we can come back together and say, well, we know it's true and we can support each other and relate. Yeah, yeah I had someone say that to me as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, yeah, I have, I like, I've tried to talk to that friend a couple of weeks ago and even bought her a book. And yeah, uh, she has not mentioned it once. <laughs> so I think she just kind of filed them. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's making me think more about um, leading by example. And, yeah. You know, just stop trying to teach people 
the information and, and unless they ask of course but yeah. showing them by by your example and then they'll ask you I guess yeah because you know what like the other night too my daughter was over and and um, I was talking to her about about her you know her state of mind and that kind of stuff and and, she, and she's really um, struggling with what does she do with her life and she's giving up on on having a passion which is sad and I hope that eventually I'll be able to you know encourage her or change her mind but she said to me mom I need you to show me so you know all the talking that I'm doing is you know maybe helping a bit at least getting her a little bit interested but she that's what she said was mom i need you to show me that's good that's an open door isn't it yeah that's really good exactly yeah. so so i think that that tells us um that we can talk all we want to to people but if they if, if we're not leading by example then it, we're not going to be believable right yeah exactly yeah. My husband wants to learn this now. Does he? Yeah. Oh my gosh, Nicole. Yeah, he said to me that I wish there had been some other way that I could have woken up, but thank you for waking me up and teach me everything you know. Awesome. That is that's fantastic. It, it really is. And, well, we've decided to start a business together. Okay. I, and we're calling it our my, my incredible life and we're going to because we do a lot of things with our kids and we continue to do all of these things with our kids even through this separation um boating and motorbike riding and um well we don't have horses anymore but um just you know having lunch well we have dinner together once a week and we've just continued doing these things and he said um yesterday because we we went on the halloween things together he said Two months ago, I would not have came come out dressed like this and walked up to people and asked for a photo opportunity and had conversations with strange people dressed in strange clothing. He said, yeah. I've just made the decision that I'm going to enjoy life and, and live life to its fullest because that's what we're here to do. And it's just a huge turnaround. Oh, awesome. so that was him in the pictures with you? Yeah. Oh, because uh, I was kind of wondering. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just being nosy, you know, that's just natural. Oh, yeah, that's so awesome. if I hadn't have stepped out and stood up for what I believed in, we would still be there doing yeah. the same, you know, routine. Where, you know, he, he had a love for watching movies and TV because when up until he was 14, they didn't have even electricity because he lived in um, um, Opal, uh, Emerald Mines. So his childhood was, you know, playing in minefields and, you know, down oh. on the ground and digging and they didn't have electricity. They, li they lived in, you know, semi-permanent housing and oh, so wow. when he found electricity and, and movies and he's a real movie buff and he could spend all day every day watching movies if you let him. Yeah. Um, and he's realised that, there's a real life outside of movies because oh, awesome. <laughs> so yeah, it's really exciting. I guess. And I'm oh, just, oh. it's really nice to know that the action that I took has been a positive for him as well as me. Yeah. Oh, that, that's fantastic. Nicole, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be lots of fun. So we, we're going to be filming things that we're doing and helping other people to do the same by sharing it. Oh, right on. And so we're going to fund it using an, an Amazon store. So funds what we're doing, getting out more and doing more things by selling mm. products associated with what we're doing. Okay, like and what? Then, like um, GoPro um, video um, oh, cameras and yeah. uh, holiday packages maybe. We haven't looked at that. They're not on Amazon, but there's probably other people that you can affiliate for. Yeah. And so you know, to, to continue to be able to do things ourselves and show other people what they can do, we'll use those products to fund what we'll actually be doing. And I thought, this is a really nice career move. <laughs> no kidding. Awesome. And, and you'll be doing it together. That's what's 
going to be so great. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And it really awesome. complements the coaching as well and teaching people about this because this is what's going to help people be able to do the things they want to do. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm really thrilled for you. Thank you. Yeah. So. So okay. then it goes on and talks about these are the steps which one may control one's economic destiny, right. freedom and independence, riches, power, fame, worldly recognition, favorable breaks, turn your dreams into physical reality. So, you know, stick to these four steps. And the world is your oyster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that is so encouraging, isn't it? That it's, it's that easy. Because I think, for me, I think I've been making it too hard. Yeah. Yeah, I think we do. I think we just don't ever analyze it all. Yes, we do. Yeah. Because our conscious mind gets in the way. Mm. And uh, that's another thing I think that Pam says, or was it uh, Dr... Uh, Maxwell Maltz in, in the psycho cybernetics that the conscious brain is there for two reasons to formulate goals and to watch for for trouble or, or um, um, danger that's the only two things it's there for the rest should be coming from our subconscious but we don't we, we override it all the time yeah yeah, we dig, we do. We dig too deep and analyze, overanalyze. Yes, exactly. That's where I like this line in um, 492. He quotes this a couple of times, I think, and I'm not sure where it originally comes from, but to thine own self be true and it must follow as night the day. Thou can't, can't not then be false to any man. So being true to yourself. And Bob says... Uh, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. So getting yeah. right down to the basic of who am I, getting rid of anything that you don't want from your person or like from your personality, being happy with yourself, listening to your conscience, and then there's not so much mishmash going on in your mind. You, you're, you're kind of free of all of that and you have a really good clarity of where you're going. Yes, exactly. I, I think does that not come from the Bible, Nicole, that? Uh, one line. Um, I'm thinking I it's it a um, a famous poet that we probably should know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that even though you know it's it's talks about a um, a love affair here. It really has a lot of principles behind this example, doesn't it? Yeah. What does he say? It's a slow, it was a slow, progressive, persistent, but sure endeavor yeah. of hers to um, get to the, to have a relationship with the man of her dreams. Yeah. And, and his story as well on the other side where he was born into all of that riches and servants and fame and power. Um, but all he wanted was a simple life with the woman of his dreams. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't often think about that, hey, that some people that may, we may um, be envious of, they don't really necessarily have a great life. And being envious of them is not the right thing to do, but I think we still do it sometimes, right? Yeah, we think to ourselves, well, what could they possibly have to complain yeah. about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's what it says in, in, in the further down in, the, in the, that chapter too, where it seemed that he had everything. Mm. It, was, it was nothing. There would be a lot of pressure, wouldn't there? And no privacy and yeah. your life is kind of dictated to you. Exactly. Yeah. I like the way he brings it down to love too. What is he, he says? What is the strongest force in the universe? He says, yeah. that and that's just <clears throat> um, emphasizing what what um, Rhonda says too, right? Yeah, that's who I was thinking about when I was reading it. Yeah, yeah. 
And I believe, too, that in, in Pam's book here, too, she's talking about um, learning to live from love instead of fear. And, that, and I right away thought about Rooney because he, ta he talks about that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he says here that, that King Edward had an emptiness which could be filled only by love. And then it's talking about his great desire, which Napoleon Hill always talks about having an mm -hmm. intense desire. Um, he doubtless felt this great universal emotion. I like the way he calls it that because that's mm -hmm. really what it is, isn't it? It's kind of the fabric that holds everything together. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And um, he was saying that the door of his soul was crying out for expression. And then um, he talks about her, ha um, his kindred spirit crying out for his same holy privilege of expression. So the, the words crying out just makes it really intense. Like it had to have been something really intense for them to um, have the persistence to stick to eventually getting there. And mm -hmm. it also backs up all through the book where he says, you know, you've got to have a, a white heat burning desire. Exactly. It gives it some intensity. And I think that was, it was um, really um, important when he talks about how he could have just, you know, had an affair with this woman. Right. And, and like, like it's been done for, for centuries before and and you know been able to have his cake and eat it too kind of thing yeah. right but he had the fortitude and the um, integrity to not not to do that yeah. i kind of i kind of laughed when it said if you know if there had been other leaders in in europe that would have had his what did they what, how did he put it would have been a, an exact good example like him then there wouldn't have been this kind of stuff going on in the world today and i'm thinking man is that ever timely yeah <laughs> about yeah. what's going on in the united states right now with that election right <laughs> yeah yeah it's a lot of um not much love going on there <laughs> oh that's for sure that's for sure and, and I like the way he talks about how they they had the courage to, or especially him, had the courage to face open criticism. Mm -hmm. so I think that's a massive thing that holds a lot of us back. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Mm. I think I stop and think about that still, even though I've been working on it for a while. When I, I think of an idea, I think the very next thing I think about is what will people think? And that's a really hard habit to break. Yeah, I guess. Hey, I, I think I've really come a long way in that regard. And, and it really makes me so sad when I see other people bending to it. It just really does. And I want to be able to, to, be able to, to explain to them how, how, um, how they shouldn't be doing this and why not. But it's, man, it's hard to, to get through to some people like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really really sad to see people that are so, so afraid of what other people are going to think of them. Yeah, and you can imagine the experiences that they must have had to get to that point, especially in childhood. Children can be really mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and adults can be pretty cold and cutting as well which yeah after you've been burned a few times you especially if they don't know this material too that they they believe that you know even some adults may be harsh and cruel thinking that they're doing the right thing for that child you mm. know making stuff or you know that kind of stuff yeah and or or you know or or teaching him a lesson that you know he has to be good in school and you know that kind of you just just strange things that that they think that they're doing the right thing because that's what our culture has taught us right yeah yeah and it's getting uh, it's sort of discouraging them from being themselves and and because we were out at port douglas a couple of weeks ago and, and there was a little girl up on the stage and she was singing and dancing and she was really putting on a performance she was about 
six, I guess. And the parents were getting embarrassed and, and auntie was at the table, you know, calling her down on telling her, shh. And I thought, let her go. <laughs> She's, this is the only time in life where you can do that. I mean, if the, it was an adult up there doing it, it would look very strange, but it was a child and it was awesome. It was wonderful yeah. to watch her just feeling, expressing herself and feeling like a superstar up on the stage. It was really cute. Yeah. And there's a good example of how we, um, how we our our creativity is like just smashed, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm embarrassing people. This must be not the right thing to do. And she, that could be the end of a huge career. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And how do we how do we get the message across? <laughs> It's, it's a big task, great, right? and I guess it's one at a time. That's all we can do is try, try to help one person at a time. Yeah, and there's another way we can set an example too. Set an example, exactly. Um, who was it? Um, oh, the actress, um, Spanish, I think, actress. Um, I think she may be married to Tom Cruise now. I don't really follow the celebrities, so but she. Uh, she was in uh, Puss in oh. Boots. Oh, you know what? I don't really know. <laughs> my or whatever. She, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, it's not her. Anyway, she she was saying, she did a very short video saying, yeah, I made a mistake. And you're coming to me and telling me that I made a mistake. Yes, yeah, so what? So what? I made a mistake. Good. Okay. <laughs> so having teaching you to have that attitude, if someone's, if you do make a mistake, especially out in public where you've said, oh, I'm going to accomplish this thing and then it doesn't happen, people will probably come to you and say, well, that didn't work, did it? No, it didn't. But guess what? I learned a few things that it's going to make it work next time. Yeah. And having that real resilient um, I know what I'm doing because I need to make mistakes to become successful attitude. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, where... a, that's a really hard one to unlearn, isn't it? That, that it's okay to make mistakes. I find that one to be a really one of the hardest ones to unlearn. Yeah. <clears throat> and even to get to the point where you believe that you need to make some mistakes to be successful. Yeah. You know, and then when you do make a mistake, you go, oh, there's another one down. <laughs> There's another one out of the way. <laughs> I like that, Nicole. That's a great way of looking at it. Because I think everyone who teaches this stuff tells you that. You know, yeah. You, you you gotta, know, I, I know it in my head. I just don't think I know it in my heart yet. Hmm. You know? And that gives you some really good backup for when someone looks at you and says, <clears throat> that was a silly mistake. Well, it wasn't a silly mistake. Just another yeah. one on the on the path, and you can have the confidence in yourself to say, "Awesome, I'm out there making mistakes, so I can be successful." Like, yeah, so at least it shows that I'm taking action. Yeah, right. Yeah, if you're not making mistakes, you're not working towards success. Yeah, and you know, it's funny how some of those sometimes you you look back and you go, oh, "That's where that saying came from." Because yeah. I had a, I worked for a, a manager in in the bank, and he said to me, and I never thought about it in this light before, but he said to me, if you don't, if you're not making any bad loans, you're not making enough loans, mm. and that's that's exactly what that was all about. Is means that you you're not making you're not making any mistakes, you're not taking enough action. Yeah, and they'd say that in sales as well. If you're not getting enough no's, it means you're not asking enough people. Yeah, there we go. That's a good one. Yeah, it's like a percentage game. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so the more mistakes you make, the more successful you get to be. Exactly. <laughs> that means you're taking more action. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's a good, much better way to look at it. It is. And, and then so you can actually be proud of your mistakes. Yeah. Man, that would be different for me. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there that would be step number two down. I think that was number two, was it not? Um, Taking action every day. Continuous action, yep. Yeah, continuous action. Yeah, and part of three as well, keeping your mind tightly closed against all negative and discouraging influences. Right. right. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So that's that's key, making sure that you're keeping the fifty one percent positive, minimum fifty one percent positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, when he talks about Edison with, I think it was the talking machine, he got it first go. After so many times, was it ten thousand attempts with the incandescent was, light bulb? Yeah, that was right. Yeah. And he said, talk about a seed of a, an equivalent benefit there you know after so many mistakes and failures that the next um the next thing invention, first first try oh did he, he didn't say that in here did he no he i think it's in the chicago lectures he, he i really got to read it. chicago um, lecture it's yeah. i listen to it live and it's in his own voice so you can really hear his enthusiasm and his tapping on the on the pulpit and getting his point across and he gets really passionate and I, I just love to get to feel the spirit of the man who wrote this book by listening to him in his own voice okay it's a series okay. of lessons i think it's about nine hours worth but he goes through each he starts with the definiteness of purpose and he goes through each of the lessons um speaking to an audience who you know are shouting out answers and clapping and oh that would be interesting. Well, then I'll have to read and uh, listen to that. And I can get that on YouTube? Uh, yes, I think it's available on YouTube. I have it on Audible on my phone. Okay, I'll look for uh, it on. And on Audible, it's called um, Napoleon Hill in His Own Voice. Okay. And well, think, uh, YouTube could be that or it could be Chicago Lectures. Yeah, I think I should be able just to, to um, search Napoleon Hill. But there's so much material on youtube it's unbelievable like mm. you can just listen for hours and hours and hours yeah i do that with esther hicks <laughs> yeah, well, I, I haven't done for so long but i just love listening to her yeah me too yeah no and i haven't listened to her for a while either mm. but yeah so in that book pam grout she quotes abraham quite a bit and um who else does she quote a few few people and it's really really um interesting how she puts it into a different perspective mm, i'm looking forward to looking at that book yeah okay, uh, so talking about henry and thomas he says henry and thomas like we know them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of gets that way doesn't it when we, you know we've been studying this material for so long it's like we have a song. good feel of their essence kind of thing. <laughs> we might as well just call them up to be on our what our advisory board, right? <laughs> well we can. That's what Napoleon Hill did, remember, with exactly. his um uh cabinet. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh so he says in line six twenty three, persistence, concentration of effort and definiteness of purpose were the major causes of their achievements. He said they had nothing else really that stood out. They weren't super intelligent or had super skills, but right. persistence, concentration of effort, and a definiteness of purpose. Exactly. So, you know, they did amazing things. Yeah. And um, the concentration of effort, too. I think that's another thing that I think she talks about in the book, about the dif difference between a laser focus or laser light and regular light how it's and and that's how how we should think of focusing yeah is, is that way because it's not as scattered the light if it's like regular light is scattered whereas laser light is just all the beams are the same length and so yeah i thought that was really interesting too yeah yeah that's really good i like it when people come up with an illustration that makes it easier to like yeah. that stick figure <laughs> how the mind works but yeah people, yeah some people just have it in their mind and if they can explain to you the way they see it sometimes it just gels with you and you can yeah yeah get it yeah 
I didn't really know very much about Muhammad um, and the writing of the Quran. No, I, haven't I didn't. really looked into him very much. No, that was that was that was an interesting story. Yeah, I, and it, it's similar to a lot of Bible stories, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So I was, I was, I think I was gonna thought he was gonna be the one that was in in the river in the reeds, but that was who was that? Uh, that was Moses. Moses, not Muhammad. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I wonder what that story, what the story is about the university. Yeah. Coming out of this. Bill would probably know. Yeah, and isn't <laughs> that interesting how he tried to to get the, the Christians and the Jews to align? Mm. Wouldn't that have been interesting if he had been successful? Yeah. Wow, he was in a totally different world. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to look up these countries because um, where are they talking about? They're talking about the state of Islam, which I wouldn't mind looking a little bit more into because they said that they would they had the ambition of taking over the world and they failed at that time mm -hmm. and I thought that was kind of interesting for that today yeah, exactly. um, hmm. okay. that's an interesting topic yeah, for for some reason, I when I was in school, I didn't really care that much about history, and and now I just I can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's interesting. Isn't it? I didn't like history at school either, but now same because it has more meaning, I guess. It, we, there's a reason to to learn about it now. I guess so. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a really good chapter. I yeah. I think I'm going to write those four steps up and make sure that I am practicing those habitually. Yeah, good idea. Mm. I will do that too. And I'm going to make myself a sign about the brakes and the gas so that I remind myself to, to get out of my way and quit overthinking things and let my subconscious take over the work. And... Um, what else can we do from what what else can we take away from this chapter the four uh, steps yeah this. yeah it's, it's closing off those negative influences yeah and so really like the four steps is a formula right so it's that plus that plus that plus that is going to equal persistence yep and success yeah Alrighty. Very good. That was well that was one of our shortest calls ever, Nicole, hey? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably because it was just you and me. Yeah, but I think we covered the material quite well. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. It, we're not historians, so we won't worry about the last bit too much. But yeah, exactly. I think I think the point there is made that they were very persistent, like ten years in the desert. Yes. And then came back to to, to be a powerful trader and people followed him and then he wrote the Quran from a man who had no um, poetry skills yes wrote one of the best um, pieces of literature uh, that's still famous today that's a pretty amazing piece of persistence yes sure yes yeah and and another um, example how anything that ever was or ever is going to be is there already right like it's just you have to just take control or or, or demand it that that you take you get your piece of it that what what it is that you want that's out there it's not like you have to invent it it's there already exactly actually i was um i looked at a portion of a documentary about muhammad ali or it may have been a an overview of his life and from the time he was a small child even though his name wasn't Muhammad Ali but he had an image of himself as that yeah that his whole life and so he was already that 
even when there's a photo there of him, I guess he was, I don't know, maybe 12 or 14 in his boxing gloves and boxing shorts. And he, in his mind, he was already that man. Yeah. And there we go. That's the, that we, we have to believe that we're it already. We have to act as if. Yeah. I, I'm sure I've seen one of Muhammad Ali's quotes and it was something similar to if, if you're not, successful or who you want to be i'm not exactly sure how he puts it pretend you are yeah be it in your mind um and that's the way he did it yeah and that the distance as well like even after is it alzheimer's no not alzheimer's parkinson's yeah um that he ended up with um he still went to the olympics and held the torch and and was involved and you could see very clearly that he was suffering. Um, you know, his arm was shaking and he obviously had this condition, um, but his persistence to still be involved in the sporting arena where a lot of people would, could be sitting at home feeling sorry for themselves, he was still being persistent and out there doing what he felt passionate about. Right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good example. Oh, there's, there's a really good point in here about um, about women complaining that this is a man's world. Should study or should take take Wallace Simpson as an example, mm. right? That was another good point in this book because there's not been a lot of that in this book. There's not been a lot of talk about women really. So this is interesting. Yeah, and you know we're we've got just as much access to universal intelligence as anyone. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So that's a good point. And it's good for women to learn that. Yeah. Like how many women are still kind of taking the back seat? And actually this business that, that I am, looking to get into and really the mentorship program it's more and more i think you know, like there's where there's single people involved but it really was kind of fundamentally uh, established around the family unit and the husband um to uh, being the leader of the family and the wife supporting mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting to, to to hear people talk about how this mentorship program has like saved marriages and that kind of stuff and how to see the couples together it's just amazing yeah yeah and uh, but it so it is a little bit still old fashioned in that way where that it's it's kind of geared towards the husband taking the leadership of the family unit and um but i i can see like there's lots of people that are single too so you know it's not like it's it's um they're being uh, ousted or are not taken into the mentorship program just because they're not in a family unit but that i think that's how it was originally designed mm, that's interesting yeah it is yeah um napoleon talks about henry ford when he was first starting up and he used to have his um equipment in the kitchen and he'd have his wife tipping the petrol into the carburetor with a thimble and helping him with his experiments at home but then when he was at the workshop he would come home at night and and run through it with her and they needed some part uh, and for the car when he was inventing the car and he was still being ridiculed and he went to the shop where you buy the parts and he asked if he could get it on credit and the guy said no i'm not going to give you anything on credit for that contraption that that you think you're going to make any money out of and he came home and spoke to his wife and and she said well we've been putting money away to buy a house and he said yeah but that's for a house we're not going to spend it on this and she said well it's only 35 dollars. we're good for it aren't we like, you're going to pay the shop back how about you just pay back the house um, uh -huh yeah account he said oh okay then yeah so he did so she was behind if it wasn't for her and her support and the mastermind that he had with her and, and her encouraging him to 
think think outside the box, he may not have gone as far as yeah. he did. Oh. That's a really interesting story. I may have heard that before, but I'm glad you brought that up again because that is that's so important. Mm, so really, oh, yeah. it was her just as much as him. I mean, it was his persistence and his ideas, but she was a yeah. big part of it. Yeah, and so a family unit can be its own mastermind group. Yeah, yeah. Well, Napoleon says that the first mastermind should be with the husband and wife. Okay, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Cool. But he also spends hours a day meditating and he talks about his walls. But the first wall, the highest wall where no one gets in, even his wife, and he said she doesn't even ask to get in because she knows that that's his sanctuary where he sits and talks with universal intelligence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's one thing that I have and still having trouble with is making myself sit still. <laughs> yes <laughs> because we're so life is so busy and i mean busy as in noise and action and stuff happening and and actual busyness like with work and chores and family and but it's there seems to be always something going on around us mm -hmm. there's a yeah. lot of noise like as in oh, just everywhere you go there's just noise there's music playing there's people speaking on the radio, going to the shops and there's, you know, um, the radio's on and there's music playing and there's announcements and there's people. You really don't get much quiet time these days. Right. So then meditation, I think, really is like partly to reset so that you stop listening to the bits of information that are the millions that are coming at you and focus on what you're supposed to be focusing on instead of all this garbage that's coming at you all the time. Exactly. And I think that's where I need to work on my persistence is being more regular with my meditation. Me too. Me too. Yep. That will be, that will help a lot. So do you, um, so tell me, how do, how do you meditate? You I meditate as soon as I finish work because I've, meditating to me is also slowing down and getting into a creative frame of mind. And mm -hmm. I kind of wake up like that anyway, so I don't see the point for me personally meditating in the morning because I'm already mm -hmm. in that idea. I've got ideas and I'm calm. and mm -hmm. you know, so. But at the end of the day, because I work with children most days, Mm -hmm. It's pretty full on. I can I work nine hours? Well, ten hours actually. I set up for half hour, work nine hours, and then clean up for half an hour. So I have a ten hour day, and it's quite full on with two year old, four two year olds. Sure. At the end of the day, I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> and yeah. that's when I meditate. So I bring myself back down. I, you know, get more clarity and feel calmer, and try and. Um, get closer to universal intelligence. So I just find that's the best time of the day for me. Plus it's, you know, 15, 20 minutes to put my feet up mm -hmm. at the end of the day as well. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you deserve it, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's, you need to tell yourself that, that you deserve to have that break. Yeah, exactly. And I, I can remember, it's not so bad now with the job that I have and I'm at home, like it's just totally different. I don't have phones ringing the people at me. So I don't, I don't have the same demands, but I remember what it felt like to be done at the end of the day and your mind just fried. Yeah. You know, and so Dr. Marx, he talks about that, about meditation to put yourself in a different state of mind to deal with your different situations. So he was, he talks about how he meditates before he goes into surgery because he was a plastic surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. To get himself so centered and and focused because you can't afford to be um si sidetracked at all when you're doing that kind of intricate um operation or surgery so he would meditate to get himself on that on the in the right frame of mind to do that but then he says but being in that kind of frame of mind is not good in a social social situation so he would have to meditate to turn himself around into a different state of mind to uh, uh, to get out of the operating room and into a social situation. Mm. 
that's interesting. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, he should. That, that should be taught to a lot of surgeons because you don't want them thinking about the fight they had with their wife last night or the groceries they have to get on their way home or exactly. you know while they're operating on your internal organs. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was really neat. So I think that convinced me that that that's why I have to meditate to just to get into the bring myself back into focus instead of allowing all of this noise going on to be taking my my laser focus off my off my goals. Yeah, getting into the fifty one percent. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there, there's a few different reasons for meditation. Yeah. Well, look at Esther Hicks. She meditated specifically for the purpose of finding out who her guide is and to receive um, um, guidance. Mm -hmm. And within a month or 15 minutes a day, there she had it because she was told by someone who was already doing it that she could do it. So she had the belief. All she had to do was meditate for 15 minutes a day and it was going to happen. It was, she believed that 100%. Yeah. So that's why it happened. Yeah. Well, that's just so amazing, isn't it? But yeah. You just have to believe. Mm. And and the universe has no choice but to bring it to you. Yeah. I like the way you and put even, that. <laughs> and even Thomas Edison says that, right? The universe has no choice. Get on the, the same vibration. Is that what you want? And there, the universe has no choice but to bring it to you, deliver it to you. Mm. that's so cool yeah just we need to shuffle out all the baggage yeah yeah so there we go meditation all righty four steps in meditation that's excellent trade on this week yep all righty all right thanks cheryl okay it's been good Thank you. thanks for popping in nat Oh yeah, she's on. She's yeah, on me. She's muted. Probably. Okay. See you, Nat. So next week, what are we doing? Next week we are going to be doing oh, mastermind. Oh, good. Yeah, the power of the mastermind. And let's see how many lines is that chapter. One. We'll be able to do that in one. Session. Oh yeah, yeah. It's really short. Not even three hundred lines. Cool lovely Alrighty. okay i'll talk to you in a couple yeah, more days hopefully, hopefully tuesday <laughs> all right talk to you then okay bye-bye bye nicole bye